I'm honoured to, to um, announce that um, we're, we're going to have Professor Martin Severs from NHS Digital, Digital the Medical Director of NHS Digital and the Caldecott Guardian, to present about the legal basis of data sharing. Now, I've, I've known Martin for about five or six years now, and um, I, I consider Martin to be a, a mentor of mine. Um, we would meet every six weeks or so when I was the Chief Clinical Information Officer of the Hampshire Health Record and have really great storming and norming conversations about information governance, data sharing and secondary uses. So um, I'm delighted to invite Martin to talk to you all about data sharing. Thank you, Martin. So thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going, I'm going to start, start off um, telling you I find this really, really, really hard. I struggle with information governance. It is quite hard. So, for those experts in the room, and, um, and, uh, and um, I can see quite a few, I'm going to apologize for trying to make it too simple, okay? I hope I don't make it too simple in terms of Einstein's uh, comments, but, but I, think I think I'll make it simple enough to get us all up to a, 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 a reasonable level. So, so you can tell how warmly the organizers of, uh, feel about me, because, because this, this is my agenda to get through today. today. All really non-contentious stuff, <laughs> all very easy, and um, you'll all be as expert as me at the end of this. So let's, let's get going. So, so, I want to start, start off with a, a few basics. <laughs> and for those of you, this is really, really too simple. I apologize. But this is what I use to start off any thinking I do before I take some action. This is the diamond of delight. And inside it, you're safe. Outside it, you've got a few problems. So the first thing at the top is the Human Rights Act. De facto, you can you need to be aware of it, but for <laughs> practical use on a day-to-day -day basis, you can more or less forget about it. The other thing you want to think about is your own legal context. Are you doing what your organization is empowered to do? Quite a, so have you got the virees to do what you're doing in your employment? Most people don't think of that. Oh, you've got, got to start, start thinking this way as we go forward, as data, data becomes more ubiquitous. You've got to be thinking, should I be doing this with this data in terms of my employment? So look at your own legal context. I work uh, for an organization that's built through statute, the Health and Social Care Act 2012. We, we are almost a creature of statute. Therefore, I can only do what it says on the tin. You need to think about that. Next, Next, you, you need to think about the common law duty of confidence. Patients tell us secrets. It's supposed, supposed to keep them secret. secret. So, you have to conform to the Human Rights Act. You have to conform to your own legal context. And you have to conform to the common law duty of confidence. What does that actually mean in practical terms? Right, well, well we, we all, all know about consent. consent. Yep, yep, that's, that's a way, way of conforming to your duty of common law. law. You, you get, get consent, consent to the patient. Can, can I do this? this? Okay. Consent, consent needs to be informed, needs, needs to be freely given, given and, and it needs to have a positive indication, indication that it has been given. Statute. There's a thing I've, I've given, given you reference to called the Copy Regulations. The control of patient information. Paragraph 5, sorry to be a bit nerdy, but can set aside the common law duty. So you don't have to conform to the common law because there's a pathway that sets it aside. NHS Digital has a mandatory law, so we can do things if directed to do so. So we can override the common law, so statute can override the common law. Court orders, you can be ordered to override it. And you can also override it on a public interest test, which is where you balance the benefits to the public against the disbenefits to the public. Okay? Broadly speaking, I'm not going to go down too many layers because we haven't got all day. 
The next thing you have to do is you have to conform to the Data Protection Act, in particular the conditions laid out in Schedule, the two schedules in the back of the Data Protection Act. You need to conform. Now, you need to conform to all of this. You can't say, and, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll take, take some clinical conversations that I often have, which is, oh, I'm DPA compliant. Yes, I know, but you, you know, are you compliant with the common law duty of confidence? The DPA is permissive. It allows you to do things. It's the whole basis of it. So I want you to start thinking about these different, these different legal frameworks in your day-to-day -day job. The next thing I want to transmit to you is consent. Is, is a difficult concept in DPA. Why is it difficult? Because if you decide to go for consent as your mechanism in the DPA, and you send out, oh, I'm going to get consent, and 50 people don't reply, once you've decided to go for consent as your mechanism in DPA, and 50 people don't reply, they have de facto dissented. You have not got consent and you can't, can't go, go back. back. So, so think very carefully before you use consent as your basis in DPA. So, so Coldy Court 3, demystified. So, so I've not done it to cyber security. This is the opt-out model framework in Coldy Court 3. You are protected by the law. I just showed you how that works. Information is essential to good quality care. Information is essential to other beneficial purposes. Caldicott is not anti-sharing. Caldicott is very for sharing done properly. You have the right to opt out. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to go down a few levels to explain that in a little bit more detail as we go through. Okay. This opt out will be respected by all organizations. They're a bit special. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're very, very important. important. Can, Can we, we opt out? Because yeah, we do things. We're going to save the world. No, no it has to be respected by all organizations. Explicit consent will be pos still be possible. And I'll explain why in a minute. As we get down a level, I'll explain why explicit consent. But in essence, you can only object when the, when the legal basis is not consent. So if you've consented to something, you've made explicit consent for something to happen. So broadly speaking, rule of thumb is a specific consent will overrule a general opt-out or objection. This opt-out will not apply to anonymized data in wh which conforms to the ICO code. We're not, and I'm using very specific language there. I'm not saying the opt-out doesn't apply to de-identified data, full stop. I'm saying the opt-out does not apply to data which is anonymized in accordance with the ICO code. And the opt-out will not apply in exceptional circumstances. So where there's a mandatory law override, civil contingencies for, is an example a mandatory request coming in, a mandatory requirement that comes in, those type of laws can override an opt-out. So, objection. This is one, this is, this is going to hurt your brains, and this is the only difficult bit, and I have to look at my slide because it hurts my brain a little bit. You have the right to object. You have the right for your objection to be considered, and you have the right to be told the result of that consideration. NHS Constitution, okay? The question is, when you consider it, what's the bar? So in DPA terms, the bar is section 10. And in, in essence, it's substantial distress or harm. So the bar is high. There's some argument not proven in law around HRA, which could be a reasonableness argue, uh, uh, um, level, bar, sorry. The current position in the UK is one of legal and policy. The policy position at the moment is that, um, con is that basically you object and your objection is honoured. Dame Fiona has said exactly the same thing. You object, your, uh, your objection is honoured. So the bar is at the level of articulation and positive action. So 
just to reinforce specific consent trumps general objection. So somebody has entered a trial on motor neuron disease but has a general opt-out come to the NHS. Digital for data, do we apply the objections to giving that out, whatever data it is, to that specific research? The answer is no, because of those, those, that patient, although they've objected, have consented to that specific study. Is that clear to everybody? Hope so. Okay. And just, so okay, so let me rephrase it if, if I've done it wrongly, sir. Thank you very much for asking the question. So the patient has an, an objection, okay? So in the, under normal circumstances, that data wouldn't leave a general practice, wouldn't leave NHS Digital, wouldn't leave a hospital. But that person has specifically said, I consent to my data from all these different places being used in this specific piece of research. So when the data moves for that specific piece of research, the general objection will not be applied. Is that, is that clearer? Yeah, sorry, thank you very much. And, uh, and we've got to be aware of, of, of severe mental illness. You know, I, in my job, get people ringing up saying, I want this to happen, I want that to happen, I want the other to happen. And sometimes those stories indicate to the people that take the phone call, this person's very ill. So we need, you need to think when people are making these choices, are they making them out of an illness or are they making them out of a informed choice? So just, just have, it, particularly the clinicians, I just want you to be aware of that as, <coughs> as, a, as a detail point to think through when people make demands and just to be absolutely sure you know where you are on that. Okay, so this is what I do in NHS Digital to conform to the ICO's Code of Anonymization. Okay, in particular what I do when I'm disseminating patient level data. When I disseminate aggregate data, I've got a special panel to look at small number suppression. Okay, so this is not all I do, but most of you are gonna be interested in patient level data dissemination. So we go through 12 different, all the 12 different constraints, and we make sure that we've addressed every one of those constraints in the ICO code. This is what we do. There isn't a defined standard out there as yet, but this is what we do. And at the, at the current time, for a given data set, a big one, PES, we've not been found wanting when we're invest we've been investigated by the ICO. So I know we're at a level that passes, if you will, I use that term advisedly, um, the ICO test to meet its code. But I don't know whether that's too tight or not tight. Well, it's certainly it's tight enough. That I'm above the bar, but I don't know whether I'm a little bit above the bar or a lot above the bar. But this is, this is what we do, and I'm sharing that in good faith in terms of openness and transparency. So... The ICO code, what patient level data, has lots of different criteria that you need to consider. I'm being very clear about it, you need to consider. This is our approach at the moment. So, IG in real life. When you get, what do I do, Nick, about X, think, what is the legal basis and confirm in your own mind's eye verbally and ideally in writing that the, they're inside the diamond of delight i'm saddened in my experience where people use ig as an excuse for laziness or not sharing 
And it's quite often in clinical practice where we do that. And we need to think through very carefully why aren't we sharing? Is it that it's just too hard? It's too much work? It's a bit of a drag? But we've got to be clear of the IG rules as opposed to operational rules. And IG is a, in my view, is as much an enabler as, it, as, it, as it's perceived as a problem. If you're not sure, it's the who wants to be a millionaire test. All right. Phone a friend. Okay. Ask for advice. Pick a member of the audience. Okay. Show reasonableness. Okay. The key test taught to me by Joanne Bailey and Dawn Moynihan and Dawn Foster is use reasonable expectations as a yardstick in your head. Would my partner would the person in the public expect me to do doing this with their data? Do they know about it? Would they expect it? So those are three different tools you can use to take you up a level in terms of making sure that your sharing is appropriate. This is the big one. We inform pa patients. We've got to get into a much more dynamic way as, pu as a public service and the opt-out will not apply in exceptional circumstances so where there's a mandatory law override civil contingencies for is an example a mandatory request coming in a mandatory requirement that comes in those type of laws can override an opt-out so objection this is one this is this is going to hurt your brains and this is the only difficult bit and I have to look at my slide because it hurts my brain a little bit. You have the right to object. You have the right for your objection to be considered. And you have the right to be told the result of that consideration. NHS constitution. Okay. The question is, when you consider it, what's the bar? So in DPA terms, the bar is section 10. And in, in essence, it's substantial distress or harm. So the bar is high. There's some argument not proven in law around the HRA, which could be a reasonableness argue, uh, uh, um, level, bar, sorry. The current position in the UK is one of legal and policy. The policy position at the moment is that, um, con is that basically you object and your objection is honoured. Then Fiona has said exactly the same thing. You object, your, uh, your objection is honoured. So the bar is at the level of articulation and positive action. So, just to reinforce, specific consent trumps general objection. So, somebody has entered a trial on motor neuron disease but has a general opt-out. Come to the NHS Digital for Data. Do we apply the objections to giving that, out, whatever data it is, to that specific research? The answer is no, because of those those that patient, although they've objected, have consented to that specific study. Is that clear to everybody? I hope so. Okay. And just so, okay. So let me rephrase it if if I've done it wrongly, sir. Thank you very much for asking the question. So the patient has an, an objection. Okay. So, in the, under normal circumstances, that data wouldn't leave a general practice, wouldn't leave NHS Digital, wouldn't leave a hospital. But that person has specifically said, I consent to my data from all these different places being used in this specific piece of research. So when the data moves for that specific piece of research, the general objection will not be applied. Is that, is that clearer? Yeah, sorry, thank you very much. And, uh, and we've got to be aware of, of, of severe mental illness. You know, I, in my job, get people ringing up saying, I want this to happen, I want that to happen, I want the other to happen. And sometimes those stories indicate 
to the people that take the phone call, this person's very ill. So we need, you need to think when people are making these choices, are they making them out of an illness or are they making them out of a informed choice? So just, just have, particularly the clinicians, I just want you to be aware of that as, <coughs> as, a, as a detail point to think through when people make demands and just to be absolutely sure you know where you are on that. Okay, so this is what I do in NHS Digital to conform to the ICO's code of anonymization. Okay, in particular, what I do when I'm disseminating patient level data. When I disseminate aggregate data, I've got a special panel to look at small number suppression. Okay, so this is not all I do, but most of you are gonna be interested in patient level data dissemination. So we go through 12 different, all the 12 different constraints, and we make sure that we've addressed every one of those constraints in the ICO code. This is what we do. There isn't a defined standard out there as yet, but this is what we do. And at the, at the current time, for a given data set, a big one, has we've not been found wanting when we're invest we've been investigated by the ICO. So I know we're at a level that passes, if you will, I use that term advisedly, um, the ICO test to meet its code, but I don't know whether that's too tight or not tight, well, it's certainly it's tight enough that I'm above the bar, but I don't know whether I'm a little bit above the bar or a lot above the bar, but this is, this is what we do, and I'm sharing that in good faith in terms of openness and transparency. So, the ICO code, well, patient level data, has lots of different criteria that you need to consider. I'm being very clear about it, you need to consider. This is our approach at the moment. So, IG in real life. When you get, what do I do, Nick, about X? Think, what is the legal basis? And confirm in your own mind's eye, verbally and ideally in writing, that the, they're inside the diamond of delight. I'm saddened in my experience where people use IG as an excuse for laziness or not sharing. And it's quite often in clinical practice where we do that. And we need to think through very carefully why aren't we sharing? Is it that it's just too hard, it's too much work, it's a bit of a drag, but we've got to be clear of the IG rules as opposed to operational rules. And IG is a, in my view, is as much an enabler as, it, as, it, as it's perceived as a problem. If you're not sure, it's the who wants to be a millionaire test. All right, phone a friend, okay? Ask for advice, pick a member of the audience, okay? Sure, reasonableness, okay? The key test taught to me by Joanne Bailey and Dawn Moynihan and Dawn Foster is use reasonable expectations. As a yardstick in your head, would my partner, would the person in the public expect me to be do doing this with their data? Do they know about it? Would they expect it? So those are three different tools you can use to take you up a level in terms of making sure that your sharing is appropriate. This is the big one. We inform pa patients. We've got to get into a much more dynamic way as, pu as a public service of telling patients what we're doing with the data. Fair processing. That's all fair processing means, really. We tell patients. And a multi-million pound organisation 
has a, has a leaflet rack in the basement <coughs> for telling patients. Just think about it. Think about the test in your own head. Is that a robust, is that a robust offering? Does that, does that demonstrate great respect for patients? So think about the channels. Think about the way to communicate and tell people openly what's happening. Privacy impact assessments for new work, really helpful. Sorts out your thinking. You might think, oh, God, not another form, not another piece of bureaucracy. No, it's actually quite helpful. It's actually think, think through a privacy impact assessment. Data sharing agreements. The number of times I go to meetings and people say, what, I've got a data sharing agreement. Yeah, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't, all a data sharing agreement means is you've thought about what's going to happen. It might not have any content about the legal basis. The data sharing agreement does not equal legal basis. Make sure you stick to the DPA principles and the Caldic or the Caldicott principles and anonymize to your best efforts in accordance with the ICO code. Right, clinical and secondary use, and I've got to speed up a bit, okay? And I'll get on a bit, okay? I mean, oh, it's all very blurred, it's all very hard. It's not, it's not. Basically, direct care takes place with a registered and regulated health or social care professional or one of their team. There is accountability and there's a legitimate relationship. I cannot, I'll keep on picking on Nick and I'm really sorry. I can't, I, Nick's not my patient. I can't go and look at me. It'd be really interesting to see what's wrong with Nick Booth. But I can't, I'm a professor. Yeah, but I'm really important. Should I be going and look at Nick's record? No. Okay. I haven't got a legitimate relationship with him. So. Used for purposes within your professional regulator, if you have one, or that which you feel is professional and you can defend if necessary. E.g., will it affect this patient deleteriously if I do not act with good faith? Could this person be harmed if I do not act with good faith? So think it through. Beware trying to justify purposes which are not direct care as direct care and use reasonable expectations test. Okay. There are some areas of tension, and in Caldicott, she's identified one of those invoice validation for regulatory consideration. Okay, so Fiona's saying there is a problem in this area. We need to think about that very carefully. Information governance and clinical safety. Information governance, in my view, is clinical governance. Okay, they are very closely aligned. Bad information governance is bad clinical governance, particularly around direct care. There's a nice guideline. 138, resharing of information to support trans transitions in care. Do we all conform to it? Do we have an audit against nice 138? There's a, there's a care and quality act with a duty to, duty to communicate. There's a duty to actually tell the next carer in GMC regulation. So sharing is very much at the heart of good clinical care. Research and evaluation is key to ensuring clinical effectiveness and safety of interventions and innovations. We need research and innovation supported by good clinical information governance. And I think good research governance includes information governance. So this is, a, this is a, an interesting case that they put in the pack. And again, they said, oh, Martin, this is a really good case. It's in the pack. Would you mind pronouncing on it? Oh, Oh no, it's really hard. So, so the first thing is, this is a dissent, it's not an objection. The basis you're sharing this person's medication is consent. So if this person's saying, I do not want my, I don't know, Viagra sharing or whatever it happens to be, because it's a bit embarrassing, that's a dissent. They're saying, and so what is the safe mechanism of handling that? because you've got a duty to inform and you've got a duty of care. So do you send, a r you knowingly send a wrong medication list? I don't know what the answer is, but I was asked to, to contemplate what I would do in this situation. So number one is you send no medication and you put a flag on it saying the patient's refused. It's one option, no information. Send another option, you send the list that they will accept, but you put a flag next to it saying it's incomplete. So that the receiver 
or the viewer actually knows it's incomplete. Or you send an incomplete list with no flag. Which do you think your doctors or other registered providers could defend? Okay, I'm not, I'm not gonna tell you what the answer is, because uh, I don't know, but I was asked to put some thoughts down how would I, I would approach it from an information governance. None of the answers might be correct. I'm, ex I'm humble enough to accept that, but in good faith for the speaker, for, the, for this sp um, talk, I've, I've done what a bit I was asked to do. Yeah, I think it might have been. <laughs> okay. So, um, do we need a national identity service for NHS staff and not just patients? Ooh, ooh. Well, <laughs> of course, because NHS staff are patients, so we need an identity. So, why wouldn't we have an identity? Are we gonna, uh, or is, is the question about two identities? Um, so, what's, what's the requirement? What, what, you know, let's peel away. Why, why was that question asked? I, I don't know, genuinely don't know why I was asked the question, but it would seem to me the way we're going with openness and transparency and greater sharing, it seems a reasonable expectation for patients to me to say, who's been looking at my record? And as we go into integrated care across <laughs> acute and community, we're going, to be able to, we're going to need to identify people that have been going into people's records and why they've been there. So it seems to me that the requirement will be around an audit trail. Now, how you can, we can argue what that you know, the extent, random sampling, is it regular, exception, all of that. But it seems to me that the requirement is around audit. So the deciding factor is what is the most cost-effective solution in a health and care system of increasing data processing to benefit the population and that determination of legitimate reason why somebody should be looking at this record. And that needs to be open, I believe, and will be open in the next few years to challenge by the public. So I've answered that. I'm not saying it's the right, but I'm, what, the, whole, the whole purpose of this is to start share some thoughts, be challenged, to help challenge you. So that, that's where I would be on, on that particular one. <laughs> Do we need a national citizen access consent service? Thank you very much for asking me that question. I think the answer is yes. But are we ready for it now? Um, absolutely not. We're definitely not ready for it now. Why aren't we ready for it now? I think there's public interest. Uh, sorry, there's public ignorance of what we're doing with their data. One. Two, the only way I can think of doing this effectively would be digitally, and therefore we dis we're excluding a, a section of the population at the moment who are not digitally able. What will happen with those that are not health literate in terms of understanding all of these different variations? Where is the pressure? Where are they going to go? Well, they'll probably go to their general practitioner that's all, who's already dying under the weight of a lot of work. So we need to think about that. Can machines help us with health literacy? Probably yes. But I'm just trying to give you reasons why I don't think now is the time for a consent model. And I don't think that the legitimate interest in going down this route would be able to agree the different levels in the time, time period of, of, of an urgent uh, time period. So I think this will happen incrementally, is, 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 is my philosophy on that. Uh, my thoughts on that, sorry. I think it'll be quicker than people may think because I think it'll, be, it'll speed up with adverse case law from outside the public service and the adverse costs of not mechanising and the massive benefits that could accrue to the economy, the NHS and most of all our patients, our citizens, our family, our friends by a greater involvement. And I know there's initiatives going on in the Northeast and other places where this is starting to be looked at in much more earnest. But, so I think we will get there, but I don't think the time is yet right. So I'm gonna leave you with some thoughts. The first is the article three of the uh, General Data Protection Regulation. Because I go to meetings and people say, oh, I've pseudoed it done a bit of pseudo. 
And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, well, that's impressive. I can't even say the full word. But just so, just, I'll just leave you with this. That pseudonymization means the processing of personal data in such a way that the data can no longer be attributed to a specific data subject without the use of additional information as long as such additional information is kept separately and subject to technical and organizational measures to ensure non-attribution to an identified or identifiable person. So that's coming in in May 2018. So if you have any doubts about the way you're using pseudonymized data, just think about just over a year's time. That's a thought. The second thing is that I struggle with all the big words in this IG and, you know, do conform to the Statistics and Registration Act 2001, subparagraph section 42. No, I don't know. I don't know. It's frightening language. So I think the conversation needs to change. I think the system needs to start talking about re-identification risk. And you think, whoa, 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 how does that help anybody? Well, we know the chance of being hit by lightning. We know the chance of being getting hit on the pavement with a car. We know the chance of having a car accident. We know the chance of choking on a beef burger. We know these facts. We can start having a conversation using real life examples with the public about the benefits and risks. We know that the public have different risk appetites for different types of sharing. We can start to put some form of conversation with normal people that we live with and, and, and work with. And I would use the, the fact that overall risk equals the data risk times the context risk. And the context risk is a, a, is, is, is a risk of the privacy being invaded or the security risk times the recipient trust. So if people keep mucking up, they're going to get more and more de-identified data. There's got to be a quid pro quo there's got, to be a, there's got to be something that stops bad behavior. Real life discourse, that's what, what would happen. We can set different risk levels. It doesn't become a dark art. It becomes much more explicit, much more open. We can build best practice into conceptual frameworks, which are open, and put weightings on them. But the most important thing is we can start instantiating them in machines, such that when people apply for data, we can get a much more interactive and they can see the results much quicker if we can mechanize this. So if we're really going to start moving at pace, I would leave you with a thought that anonymization can change the conversation. And we need to change that conversation to talk about re-identification risk. So with that, I think I'm one minute over, but I apologize for that, for the organizers' apologies. I'll finish. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Martin. That was a very thought-provoking thought, and um, I very much look forward to having conversations about re-identification with you over the next couple of days. Um